Chapter 1, The Post-Glacial Flooding Hypothesis In the first book of this trilogy The Post-Glacial Flooding Hypothesis, we looked at the new mathematical models that allowed us to calculate the amount of water that was released during and after the last glacial maximum just over 10,000 years ago. These models showed us that a minimum of 8.42 quadrillion tons of water was released on the UK at the end of the last ice age. This is equivalent of 98,425 inches of rain, falling on every inch of Britain's landmass, or the same as, one inch of rain steadily falling every day for the next 270 years. So how would that affect the landscape? The worst known flooding in British history occurred in 1947 when just 6 inches of rain, 149 millimeters, fell on up to 12 inches of snow, so a maximum of 15 inches of rain if melted, over a three-month period. The flooding, which inundated nearly all the main rivers in the South, Midlands, and the northeast of England, was notable for its origins, geographical extent, and duration. Impacting on 30 out of the 40 English counties over a two-week period, when around 700,000 acres of land became flooded. Tens of thousands of people were temporarily displaced from their homes, and thousands of acres of crops were lost and this was just 15 of the estimated equivalent 98,425 inches of water that was shed on the British landscape after the last ice age. This is the reason that rivers, like the Thames, still flow even after months of drought, as the groundwater is constantly leaking into the river, which was at its highest rate at the start of the Mesolithic, just after the great meltwater floods. Sea level changes. If this model is correct, we should be able to get verification, via other empirical evidence as shown in sea level water rises, to see if it has been constant over the last 12,500 years. Most geologists and paleoclimatologists, when talking about the end of the last ice age, refer people to the phenomenon called the meltwater pulse, which is the rapid rise in sea level, 20 meters, between 13,500 and 14,700 years before present, over a 400 to 500 year period. Although it is a tremendous value, it should be recognized that this pulse is only 16% of the total sea rise since the end of the last ice age. We have constructed a model of sea level changes, by combining both the Warden Sea model and the NASA sea level model, to calculate the rise in sea level in the North Sea area, and the discharge levels from the rivers, that flow into the area over the last 10,000 years, since the last ice age. When we put all the information about the Holocene together including the vast amounts of meltwater, ice melt pulses, raised water table and increased precipitation, then we are left with evidence of increased water activity, volume and consequential levels of Holocene rivers. We have also added the increased precipitation during this period, to our graph, to indicate the reasons for the river flooding events. Therefore the blue discharge line, on the graph, is an indication of the volume discharge and hence the size and height of rivers over the last 10,000 years. The chart uses today's discharge rate which represents one unit of river flow, this gives us a simple visual comparison to previous years, as a ratio of size. Hence 8050 BCE, the rivers were 140 times larger than today. Other post-glacial flooding around the world. The flooding after the last glacial maximum was not only limited to Britain. We have shown from the first book of the trilogy, that massive flooding occurred in Northern America, showing the discharge from rivers such as the Mississippi increasing from today's rate of 16,790 cubic meters per second to 160,000 cubic meters per second just after the last glacial maximum, an increase of 853%, clearly showing an increase in river height. We also see the same river level discharge increases in Germany, and consequently the historical flooding of the Black Sea, some 2,000 miles from the ice sheet, which turned from a fresh water to a salt lake, when it overflowed into the Mediterranean. We therefore investigated the Thames, as a case study, to see how Britain's largest river was affected in the Mesolithic and Neolithic periods. 
This was achieved by constructing a discharge model based on the sedimentary data supplied by the British Geological Society's superficial maps of the areas, and some borehole core samples. The conclusion of this study was that the current average discharge of 65.8 cubic meters per second was increased by 3,723% within the watershed area, which allowed us to estimate that at its peak the Thames River discharged 2,450 cubic meters per second. About the same rate of one of the smaller rivers of North America during the same period. Which begs the question as the Thames is the largest river in the country, would it not have been affected more by the meltwater at the end of the last ice age? So, have the geologists got the extent of the alluvium flooding correct? To explore further, we needed to look at detailed excavations and boreholes undertaken at the edge of the British Geological Society superficial alluvium flood map, to get some real evidence about what sediments are present which would allow us to better understand the dates and extent of the flooding. If take a cross-section profile of the Thames, and search for boreholes on that line we find that the Holocene superficial sediment is actually present in a wider area of one mile, and is terminated by boreholes TQ47NE344 and TQ58NW141. Borehole TQ47NE344, shows 5.95 meters of brown silty sand, before hitting chalk, and TQ58NW141, 4.42 meters of loamy sand and stones, with a base of sand and gravel. This increases the Thames flood model, from a discharge of 2,450 cubic meters per second, to 12,250 cubic meters per second, which reflects more accurately the North American discharge model. Peat, ultimate evidence of Holocene flooding. The formation of bogs in the UK began 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age, when glaciers retreated northwards, leaving behind a landscape of shallow meltwater lakes and waterlogged hollows. An estimated 2.3 million hectares, 9.5% of the UK land area, is covered by bog peatlands. Hence, they allow scientists to reconstruct past environments and changes in land use. Unlike subsoils, such as head and alluvium, most peat bogs can be accurately carbon dated. This is central to understanding post-glacial flooding as the flooded areas of Britain would be major contenders to accumulate marshes and bogs that would create the peat subsoils of today. We can use peat not only to find the Holocene wet areas and raised river levels, but moreover, we can also use them to identify the size and flow of the rivers during the Mesolithic and Neolithic period. Blanket bog occupies approximately 6% of the area of the UK today. The Holocene expansion of this hyperoceanic biome has previously been explained as a consequence of Neolithic forest clearance. However, the present distribution of blanket bog in Great Britain can be predicted accurately with a simple model based on summer temperature and moisture index thresholds, and the same model correctly predicts the highly disjunct distribution of blanket bog worldwide. This finding suggests that climate, rather than land use history, controls blanket bog distribution in the UK and everywhere else. The maximum rate of peat production is not as one would expect directly after the meltwater flooding at the end of the last glacial maximum, because if the water subsided quickly, then its peak peat rate would occurred in the early Holocene period. But what we see, is that the peak growth is 4,000 to 6,000 years later, as we see in Scotland. The reason for this, is because the rivers were at their highest and fastest, early in the Holocene, not allowing the right environment for the growth of marshes and bogs. It is only when the rivers start to subside, that peat's beginning to form, which is only interrupted, by occasional flooding, due to precipitation towards the end of the Neolithic period, and the onset of farming. Case Study, River Avon the fluvial deposits in the area form a flight of 14 river terraces. The highest terraces, up to 100 meters above the Avon Valley floor, spread up to 12 kilometers wide from the present-day river axis. The lower terraces in the Avon catchment are 6 to 3 kilometers wide and are found alongside and below the present-day river. 
The massive extent and limited altitudinal separation between the highest terraces point to the draped deposition of these terraces over the landscape. The Avon Terraces, the pre-quaternary geology is briefly discussed in a publication Crustal Uplift in southern England. Evidence from a river terrace records illustrated that there were several terraces from the River Avon still visible in the Hampshire Basin which they called T5 to T10. Little has been done to determine the age of either the terrace sequence or the older river gravels in the Avon Valley. The optically stimulated luminescence dating of river terraces make this dating more confused when a recent publication called Pleistocene Landscape Evolution in the Avon Valley, Southern Britain, Optical Dating of Terrace Formation and Paleolithic Archaeology produced a set of results that question the way previous geologists have dated these river terraces. This diagram presents the optically stimulated luminescence, known as OSL, results per terrace and in relationship to the marine isotope stages, known as MIS. The schematic valley cross-section as shown in the illustration is also based on the 3D model of the superficial geology of the Avon Valley, built-in rock works based on BGS borehole data. The OSL ages for T107 suggest deposition during or before MIS 10 or 9. They are broadly in agreement with, but potentially offer a refinement of, previously proposed relative chronologies used for dating the archaeological record of T7 and the calculation of regional uplift and incision rates. The first observation you can make from these results is that they are inconsistent at best and almost random at worst. It is clearly not what was expected by the team as the supposed oldest terrace at the top T10, at the height of 102 meters OD or sea level, was laid according to the OSL dating method, over a 200,000 year period. This is compounded with T7 terrace, 58 meters OD, being dated, before T10. But the most compelling evidence of the problems, with this old dated terrace hypothesis of yesteryear, is the loose terrace at, 77 meters OD, undifferentiated level T, which was laid during the last glacial maximum, as was T4, which has the youngest dates. The authors attempted to explain this remarkable result by suggesting, therefore, more plausible explanations for this discrepancy, between the age estimate of T4 at Fisherton, and that at Bicton, are either that T4 at Bicton includes sediments reworked during more recent fluvial processes, or that T4 is a compound terrace exhibiting differing depositional behavior, in the upper and lower catchments. When we look at the new OSL method of dating we are not fully assured of its accuracy, as seen by the dating of sediment sample GL14039 which was dated as 70,000 years before present, plus or minus 8,000 years, and sample GL14041, at the same soil level which was dated 58,000 years before present, plus or minus 4,000 years. Also sample GL14038 which was dated 86,000 years before present, plus or minus 6,000 years, and sample GL14040 dated 70,000 years before present, plus and minus 4,000 years. Not only indicating questionable dates at the same level, but the amount of sediment laid down over from topsoil to first two samples, 62,000 years represented by 83 centimeters of soil depth, 1.33 cm per 1,000 years, and then just 16,000 years represented by 70 cm, 0.23 cm per 1,000 years. Therefore, this evidence would question the accuracy of the OSL dating method. If history is repeating itself as with radiocarbon dating, then over the next 50 years, these results will be more accurately defined. But what these samples do show is that dating these levels by visual evidence alone is not accurate as the report also confirms. What also was missed by the report, was the evidence as previously shown in our case studies in this section, and the number of river flooding that occurred in the Holocene, and consequently must have flooded some of the older river terraces. I suspect that is why the terraces between T7 and T10 are of river silt and dates that are out of sequence to the above and below terraces. There are obvious problems with uplift modeling based on relative altitudes of terrace deposits, and the use of the Paleolithic record as a chronological marker, and indeed the age proposed by Maddy et al. 
2000, and Westerway et al. 2006, for T7, Wood Green Paleolithic site, is not in agreement with our chronometric date of 389 to 243 before present. And this apparent problem is compounded by the fact, we have also shown in this section, that during the period 389 to 243,000 years before present, the sea level analysis shows that the ice during this period was of a lesser extent than the last glacial maximum, and therefore would affect the river terraces less rather than more. Finally, archaeologists and geologists resist the fact that the River Avon was in Stonehenge Bottom during the Mesolithic and Neolithic period. They insist that there is no evidence in the form of alluvium or colluvium in sufficient quantities to support my hypothesis. This objection has a simple solution as Julian Richards suggested in his book The Stonehenge Environs Project, colluvium sediments may have been removed or thinned by the action of seasonal streams or higher water tables in the past. Macklin, as we have now seen has identified over 100 Holocene river floods, 12 of which lasted hundreds of years, that would have contributed to this lack of alluvium or colluvium at Stonehenge Bottom. Moreover, the sources of the rivers that lay this sediment over the centuries of water flow, rely on massive precipitation entering the rivers, cutting through rocks and valleys making them flow at extreme levels which create this erosion and consequential sediment. However, the source of Paleo Channel water are natural springs found locally underground and therefore would not contain the same alluvium levels as active flowing rivers, resolving this dilemma. Let us recap what we have learned in this chapter. 1. The steady rise in sea levels over the last 10,000 years proves that water was still sitting on the land in the form of enlarged rivers, which would have kept the landscape flooded for thousands of years after the ice had finally melted. 2. Lewis and Macklin's 2003 scientific paper proves that Britain was flooded over 100 times in the past 10,000 years, with some of these events lasting hundreds of years. 3. Peat is a product of wet marshy ground and plant growth, this proves not only the extent of the post-glacial flooding but moreover the dates of these episodes. 4. The Avon terraces between T7 and T10 consist of river silt, and the OSL dates indicate that they are out of sequence to the traditional observational model.